Hello, my name is Sina Seidlin. I'm an associate professor at the physics department. My research activities are taking place at the Neal Institute in the nanophysics department. Today, I want to review with you some of the concepts in classical mechanics, and I want to try to do some fun experiments. But let's start out with Sir Isaac Newton that you can see up here. So his first law stated that in the absence of external forces, an object will be moving at a constant velocity. So this is actually a little bit strange when you think about it, because we usually need to provide a force to move an object along. For instance, if I want to make this here moving along, I need to provide a force. But actually, what I'm doing, I'm just providing a force that's compensating other external forces. In this case, the external forces, of course, would be friction. So when I'm pushing this along, I'm actually just making the sum of forces equal to zero, such that it's move, it moves along at a constant velocity. So let's write this down. So Newton's first law. So it says the sum of external forces equal to zero. That means that the velocity is constant. OK, so Newton's first law can be derived from a law that you know very well. And that's Newton's second law. And Newton's, so right. That one down, Newton's second law, which states that the sum of external forces is equal to the mass of the object times the acceleration. OK, and this law here, we can use that to derive the first law. So of course, if the sum of external forces um, is equal to zero, that means that the acceleration must be equal to zero as long as the mass is not zero. So if the acceleration is zero, that means, of course, that the velocity is constant as the acceleration is equal to the derivative of the velocity. So this law here can actually be, be derived from an even more general law, also stated by Newton, which is that the sum of external forces is equal to dp dt. And p is the momentum of the system. And the momentum is equal to the mass times the velocity. OK, so in French, this quantity here is actually called quantité de mouvement. And that was the term that Newton originally used to describe. He called it quantity of motion. And if you take this quantity here, the m times v, and then you plug it into this formula here, you know that the mass is constant. So the mass can go outside, and then you just have the derivative of the velocity times the mass, which is, of course, equal to the mass times the acceleration. OK, so this law here, we can write it in a little bit different way. And we can write it down as the sum of external forces, and then I multiply with the dt on both sides. Mathematicians would not do it that way. We're physicists, so we can do that. So I would say this times dt is equal to dp. Or I can take a step in even further, and I can write the sum of external forces. And instead of dt, I just write delta t, so a very short time. And that's equal to delta p here. So what does that mean? That means that the change in momentum is equal to the sum of external forces times the time here. And that means that the quantity of motion, or the momentum, as we say in modern English, is equal to this term here. So if this term here is zero, so if there are no external forces, that means that the momentum is conserved. 
So let's try to do a little experiment with this here. So I'll take this piece um, of paper and a coin here, and I'll put that vertically here. If I can make it stand straight. Okay, so the idea is now I want to remove the paper without making the coat fall off. So let's see if that works. Okay, so it worked, luckily. Okay, so you can see the coin did not move. It was standing still before I hit on the paper and it's still standing still. So the delta P here is equal to zero. It was zero before and zero after. So how is this possible? Because obviously there was a large friction when I was pulling out the paper. So there was a friction between the coin and the piece of paper. So the sum of external forces here was of course not equal to zero. But what happened was that I was hitting so fast on the paper that the delta T here was so short that even though this was not zero, the whole thing here was very close to zero. So that the delta P was equal to zero and the momentum was conserved. Okay, so let's now try to do another experiment that has to do with friction and also with gravity. And it's known as the Tower of Pisa experiment. It's a very classical experiment, originally performed by Galileo Galilei, the gentleman that you can see here. And it was performed in 1589 in order to prove that the theory of gravity of Aristotle was actually wrong. Aristotle claimed that heavy objects go to the ground much faster than light objects. So let's try to repeat that experiment. So in my left ham hand I have a hammer and in my right hand I have a feather. And let's try to see which goes to the ground faster. Okay, I think that it was obvious that the feather went down um, much slower than the hammer. But this is actually a little bit puzzling if we look at the theory. So let's go back to Newton's second law that the sum of external forces is equal to the mass times the acceleration. And let's try to write this system down for the hammer first. So that would mean that the sum of external forces, that's gravity, and if I place an axis here, oriented toward the ceiling, then I can write down that the external forces here is given by, so it would be the mass of the hammer times the acceleration, the gravitational constant times i, and as it's oriented towards the ground, I would put a minus sign here. And that's equal to the mass of the hammer times the acceleration. Okay, of course here you can see I can divide by the mass of the hammer in both cases, and that would mean that the acceleration is simply equal to minus g times i. So it would accelerate with 9.82 meter per second square towards the ground. Of course, in this equation here, I could, instead of the mass of the hammer, have put the mass of the feather, so mf, and the acceleration would have been the same. So supposing the two objects have the same initial velocity, that they would go to the ground with the same speed. So, of course, you already guessed why this is not the case. Of course, light objects are much more sensitive uh, relative to friction. So the friction was actually making the feather go down much slower than the hammer. So in the sum of the external forces, I should put the friction if I need the math to turn out right. Instead of doing that, I want to show you that we can actually do an experiment where both items go to the ground at the same speed. This experiment, the Galilei, Galileo experiment was done or was repeated at the moon. At the moon there's almost no atmosphere, so you're very, you have very little friction. Here we can't, of course, remove the atmosphere, but what I can try to do is try to take a tube that I can pump free from air. First, let's try to look right now, the, the tube is full of air the valve is open, and inside the tube I have some light objects, which are some cardboard discs, a silver and a red one, and a small ball 
that's very heavy compared to the other ones. So if I turn this around here, you can see that the, that the heavy object is, of course, falling down faster than the cardboard discs. OK, but let me now try to pump this tube free from air. So I'll put it on a pump here, if I can. This is experimental physics, so so here we go. I screw this into here, then I can exercise my arms a little bit, and then I'll start pumping. I have the valve open, so I'm pumping now, and I'm removing all of the air inside here, and that takes a little while. So I think this is good enough for now. So what I want to do is I want to close the valve. And I turn the pump off. And now we'll see if we have that the objects are going down with the same speed. So I think it's more or less the same speed with a little bit of goodwill. So that proves that both Newton and also Galileo were right, and Aristotle was actually wrong. So, I don't know if you ever spent your nights awake wondering why momentum is actually a conserved quantity. This turns out to be related to what we call the translational invariance of space. This can fast get really subtle, so I don't think we should go too much into detail with this right now. I just want you to notice that space actually also has a rotational invariance which leads to another law of conservation. And I want to do an experiment to illustrate this. So I want to sit down on the ch a chair that can spin around, and then I want to hold in my hands some weights, and then I want you to observe what happens to the speed of rotation on the chair when I'm pulling in and out my arms. So the experiment goes like this. So I'm pulling in my arms, stretching them out, I'm pulling them in, and I'm stretching them out. Okay, so those kind of experiments makes you very dizzy, and it makes the head spin as well. But let's just try to see what happened. So as you observed, when I was stretching my arms out, I was slowing down, and when I was pulling them in, I was actually starting to spin around much faster. So obviously, the thing that's concerned is not uh, speed of rotation, that obviously changed. But the thing that's conserved is what we call angular momentum. And we usually use the letter L to denote the angular momentum of a system. And if there are no external forces acting on the system, this is a conserved quantity. And it's conserved both its direction and its norm. And let's try to write down the norm of L for the system I just presented to you. So. I make a drawing, so this here will be me sitting on the chair, spinning around, with the arms stretched out, and in my arms I have the weights that I put here in red, and the mass of those weights here, we'll call those masses M, I have two of them, and then I want to denote the speed of rotation here, omega, and then finally I want to denote the length of my arms here, r. So in this case here, l, the norm of l can be written as two times, because there are two masses, times the mass, times r squared, which is the distance here, times the speed of rotation, omega. Here. So what happens is that this is a conserved quantity. So when I pull my arms in, this term here, r, actually decreases. So in order to conserve L, when this decreases, so this would be smaller, this omega here, the speed of rotation, will obviously need to increase to compensate to keep this term constant here. And this it decreases as r squared, so this omega would have to spin much faster around to keep L constant. Okay, 
So all we've been talking about so far is classical mechanics. When things are getting really small and tiny, actually down on the scale of atoms and molecules, then quantum mechanics kick in. And in quantum mechanics, we have some mysteries like wave functions, superpositions, and entanglement, and things are getting really intriguing there. In my research group at the Neel Institute, we're actually trying to understand what happens exactly on the borderline between a classical system and a quantum mechanical system and see how those two systems interact. And here physics is getting even more exciting. But I think this is enough for today.